share with you. Um, thanks for the introduction. Thanks especially to the organizers. I know um, I know things have been crazy, uh, and but from my perspective, at least, nothing has been anything but smooth. So I really appreciate being here. I appreciate um, the hospitality that uh, was shown by everybody. It's nice to see some old friends again, and uh, I really genuinely look forward to meeting uh, most of you. Well, I look forward to meeting all of you. I'll probably be happy to have met most of you. Um, <clears throat> over the course of what looks like a, a really interesting couple of days, and uh, yeah, I think it's going to be great. I want to say just before I start with this talk, which will be somewhere between 45 minutes and an hour, I think, um, it's a little bit more schematic than my usual work. So I like to think, at least, and, and I'm told that my work tends to be uh, relatively textual, or maybe even extremely textual. Uh, and that could take the really two forms. One is the kind of classic form of close reading that uh, probably many of us were trained on, and um, you know, that's certainly my kind of go-to method of working through text and ideas. Uh, but also, you know, there's a part of my practice that is textual in this other sort of more experimental uh, sense of textuality, uh, maybe a more poetic approach, uh, although I don't really think of it that way. Certainly experimental. So right now I'm co-authoring a book, um, well, co-authoring a I hope will be a book, it's almost done. Uh, and the whole book is structured around a series of, uh, for my part, um, fictional auditory dreams, right? And so, so you can immediately see that the gambit of working in that way introduces some work that's done by the actual writing. Uh, the other person who's doing it is working on sort of uh, mechanisms of visual hallucinations. So that's how I'm most comfortable working, and this isn't that. Um, this talk is a little bit schematic, and I'm not saying that as an apology, because you know I've worked on it sincerely and, and I've done my best, uh, but maybe as an expression of uh, I want to say vulnerability, but not you know it's not vulnerability as in I'm going to be hurt if you're not happy with what I say. <laughs> vulnerability in the sense that I, I genuinely uh, am open to questions, suggestions, um, uh, or any other kind of interjections uh, that you might want to make. So. With that non-apology over the way on the start. Um, listening in significantly. So contemporary technoculture with its characteristic coupling human activity with unthinkable machinic speeds and scales intensifies, I think, a basic but essential problem of how to act responsibly when one's actions are implicated in nonlinear networks that exceed, that exceed the purview of one's consciousness. And this is something uh, I've thought about it in a lot of my So in this talk, what I'm going to try to do is listen alongside some of the ways that sounding art has uh, addressed, or attempted to address, might be to address this bind. And specifically, I'm going to argue, again, as I have before, but in different ways, I want to argue that orality, A-U, right, orality, 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 orality informed approaches to digital technologies, and to algorithms in particular, can reveal certain perceptual biases that underwrite those technologies. And I think what that does is it opens the ground for meaningful interventions in their use, their design, and their dissemination. So I'm going to work through this argument by hopefully briefly palpating three artworks. I'm going to start with the consideration of an algorithmic piece of music. Um, and I want to attend in particular to the way that the piece restages a, a specific understanding of what creative insight is. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, I'll explain the piece in more detail in a few minutes, but what I'll try to show is that this approach to listening that the piece provokes, which I'm going to call a static listening, but you know, it's, it's not like I'm trying to coin a term, or it's not like I'm going to defend that term. I'm just going to use that as a kind of conceptual show. Here. So the approach to listening that the piece provokes implicitly problematizes this specific take on creativity. And it's a take on creativity that I think deserves problematizing because I, I would say it's uh, one of these cultural dominants, as problematic as that term is. And so I'm thinking specifically of this kind of Richard Florida style uh, creativity that acts as a prime driver, where creativity acts as a prime driver. Uh, it acts as a, uh, another word for um, a novelty in capitalist economies. Right? Or novelty is not the word I'm looking for. Uh, anyway, <coughs> creativity as a prime driver in capitalist economies. I'm not going to get into that. Um, I think there's lots of great work that's been done critiquing uh, this kind of taking up of creativity, uh, especially Florida's work, but it's not really my goal. 
So with respect to the piece of music specifically, I think what it does is it makes clear the necessity of accounting somehow for ongoing affective attunement in our considerations of human technology and coupling. And that's a perspective that I'm going to try to draw further by uh, thinking about another work by a really brilliant artist named Juliana Favato. She has a piece called Yesterday Walks More. And then I'll close by reading a video installation by another really brilliant artist named Renee Weir. Uh, in terms of the purchase that aesthetic listening as a kind of sustained practice uh, can give us on the challenges posed by distributed digital networks. Now, part of the reason why I'm offering that roadmap uh, is because the last piece I want to kind of briefly talk about first, uh, and I want to note in advance that this final work, Weir's, Renee's uh, video piece, is silent and isn't even st staged as a silent piece. Right? It's not a silent sound art piece, it's just a piece of video. Right, so it's not like Cage's famous four minutes and 33 seconds, where you have something that's silent, but rhetorically that is a kind of sounding piece. Right? Instead, this Rene identifies primarily as a visual and performance artist. The piece has nothing to do with sound per se. And I'm pointing this out now because I think it's integral to understanding one of the predicates of the argument that I'm going to try to make, right? which is that, in fact, in my understanding, morality has to encompass practices that make literal use of, of sound, of course, but also it stands to listening itself as a kind of comportment towards attunement, right? In the sense that listening is a dynamic process of learning and self-development where sense resounds beyond significance. You might recognize that uh, sort of couplet as a uh, seems way of thinking about this. So sound as a kind of material discursive apparatus thus opens a particularly promising field of possibilities in this context, to my mind. If sound, as Brandon LaBelle, who's usually quite an elegant writer, but this is a tortured quotation, but it, as he puts it, if sound undermines form as stable referent by always moving away from its source while slipping past the guide of representational meaning by exceeding the symbolic, right, which is, again, I'll just read it again. So if sound, as LaBelle puts it, undermines form as a stable referent by always moving away from its source while slipping past the guide of representational meaning by exceeding the symbolic, if that's the case, then to listen is to somehow become sensitive to a certain recondite economy. So it's not only possible, I think, to listen to visual processes, right, but it's arguably, I would say, necessary to develop non or at least a visual techniques for steering human technology coupling, right? Techniques for becoming agential through distributed attunements. And I think it's necessary in order to address the unvisualizably immense and minute scales that subtend so many of our contemporary experiences. Right? So today, more than ever, visuality is less about literal seeing, literal seeing, right? and more gears towards organizing the world according to a particular logic, or for being generous in logics. So the simple example that probably most of you know, but I think it's worth remembering, uh, is the famous double helix shape of DNA, right? which of course, is literally and constitutively and definitionally invisible because DNA is smaller than the wavelength of light. Right? This is also the case for many nanotechnologies and applies in different ways, but similarly to phenomena ranging from computer processor speeds, which I talked about a couple of years ago when I was here, uh, to global warming to distributed communications networks. So despite DNA being constitutively invisible, as people like uh, Gene Thacker and one of my favorite uh, people to read these days, Amanda Butskys, uh, and many others have shown in really convincing ways, numerous aesthetic and technical accomplishments are premised on DNA looking the way that we visualize them, right? Which is, I think, a really incredible <coughs> testament to vision's migration beyond its own enabling condition, right? It's migration beyond reflected light, if you will. And thus, hopefully, the urgency of cultivating listening beyond literal sounds. So in sum, of the, the summary in advance, if you will. Uh, I want to argue that well, algorithmic compositions often present a piece to listen to in order to hear the existence of technical processes that exceed our conscious senses. Other approaches, maybe more, more readily of our implication in this hearing, teaches how to leverage the aesthetic dimension of our couplings in order to learn how to act in new ways. In short, as Jonathan Stern puts it, since the point of recording, sorry, in, in short, since, as Jonathan puts it, uh, the point of recording and reproduction is not to mirror a phenomenon, but rather to shape it actively, end quote. Uh, I want to make the case that listening in the full sense, listening to algorithm compositions, but also 
from and through the lessons that they teach us is about learning how to shape the human computer systems that we all live within. Can you hear me okay in the back? Somebody said that I might even remember. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So in the context of sound art that makes use of digital computers, theories of algorithmic composition have typically been distinguished by two types. And I'm just going to talk about this really, really quickly, extremely quickly. The two types are essentially score synthesis and sound synthesis. So score synthesis, synthesis is when a computer uses, or when a composer, <laughs> when a composer uses a computer to work out some sort of problem in advance. And then from the result of the worked out problem, they then notate something you know, by, by hand, which also is using the computer typically. Uh, that is then played by acoustic instruments. So the, the kind of algorithmic work is done pre -comp or, uh, as the compositional work, but the actualization is done uh, through physical instruments. And as you can probably predict, then the other is sound synthesis, and that's where the computer aided working out of a kind of synthetic sound produces music or sound that happens through loudspeakers exclusively, right? So you kind of bypass the whole problem of uh, acoustic performers. So that's, uh, that's the way that uh, algorithms are typically used by composers who are using digital computers. But if one understands the word algorithm as, you know, to mean simply the broad, in a broad sense, a finite set of rules and instructions, then I think it's not hard to see, and it's I think, manifest, that algorithms have been integral to music, sound art, and the visual arts for literally centuries. Right? Which is only to just point out that not only can artists use algorithms towards a variety of ends, but they can also use them in a whole variety of ways. Um, we can note in all of these cases, though, in my mind, I hate saying things like that, which is why I say things like that. Uh, we can note in the, all of these cases is that algorithms function as well as their, whatever other function they perform. They also function rhetorically as a shorthand for the coupling of humans and techniques that is always implicitly or explicitly part of creative practice. Right? So what connects the myriad artistic practices that might be considered algorithmic, however broad or narrow our notion of that is, is a conjecture, often unstated, that creativity is in some important sense technical, right? Which is to say that we have to eschew or at least supplement this romantic perspective that understands creativity as the progeny of an authorial genius. And we have to do that in favor of an understanding that avows the role of specific, contingent, machinic processes, right? So to work algorithmically is not simply to offload calculative labor to a machine, Right? but rather to somehow meaningfully engage the creative process itself by making explicit the ways that such labor produces the creative insight from which it then appears to follow. Right? Uh, Otto Lask, who's a musicologist, I think perfectly summarizes this. He says, the task environment of a computer-assisted composer is more than a set of tools and materials. It's rather a habitat in which the composer lives, and its elements are partners in an ongoing conversation. So while well, Lask is speaking specifically about the composition of music, it seems self-evident to me, at least, that we can generalize this statement to note that human agency is less accurately described in terms of a kind of known subject in full possession of themselves and makes use of a passive world that stands as a reserve for the actualization of their desires, right? But that's less the case, and it's more effectively thought human agency is in terms of a distributed ecology of patterns, textures, feedback loops, redundancies, and so forth, that do and do not subtend the scales and perceptions of human individuals. Now, obviously, I think, this understanding is crucial if we're in any sense interested in locating creativity, which is, I think, part of understanding, uh, understanding what creativity might be. So this is the context in which I want to talk about this 2012 algorithmic composition tool by a California composer, Edmund Mertz. Um, I think it's instructive. Because Mertz's approach to algorithmic composition explicitly engages the question of creativity as one of location. I'll say uh, with this work, I'm, I'm neither kind of exalting this work or, or demeaning it in any way. I think it's a case of a piece uh, that is exemplary of a, a whole bunch of work that is done, but also exemplary of, of an instance that does this work 
in a way that's easy to understand. Um, so take that, take it all with a grain of salt. Basically, how it works is he makes Mertz does makes pre-compositional use of a software program. So before he sits down to compose, as it were, he uses a software program that chooses sounds from a database of sound samples uh, at a website called freesound.org. Does anybody know freesound already? Yeah, one person. So essentially, this is a um, open uh, platform where anybody can upload sound samples to a website, basically. So you can record yourself, you know, washing your face or you can record your band, you can upload this with a fairly high degree of um, uh, length difference, and it goes into this database, and then anybody can use it in any way they want. So Mertz writes this software program that basically uh, uh, <coughs> scrolls through this database pre-compositionally, uh, as it were, and chooses a sound based on its oral similarity to another sound. So he does an initial, chooses an initial sound, as we'll hear, and then orders the rest of the, uh, the rest of the database based on its similarity to that initial sound according to this algorithm. This algorithm is tuned to uh, several different understandings of uh, perception of sound, which is sort of funny because those different understandings are competing understandings in part because uh, you know, no one person hears through all of those understandings. So you have this sort of funny synthesis of different ways of uh, designing algorithms for sound perception. That's a kind of aside. So what he sort of does, the rule he sets, again, pre-compositionally, is to say, troll this database, uh, not troll in the sense that Liam uses the word, uh, <laughs> troll through, troll this database, um, searching and ordering it based on similarity. But when you get to a certain, because of course for a computer to measure similarity, it, it is then numeric in some sense. So when you get to a certain degree of similarity, when you exceed a certain degree of similarity, orally, instead of going to the next sound that is most orally similar, choose one that is lexically similar. So these free sound databases, of course, have to be accessed through tags. That's how you can find the sounds you're looking for. Uh, and he uses, uh, I think the website's wordnick.org, he uses some uh, protocols from there to basically choose oral simil or lexical similarity when <coughs> certain oral similarities exceeded. Uh, you can see the stages of this maybe more clearly here. So what results from this is a kind of data table, which I'll show in a second, that's conducive to being visualized as a basic uh, nodes and edges graph, which again, I'll show an example of that in a second. Um, so the compositional process from this point, so that's all pre-compositional to kind of generate this ordering, which is a field, you know, like the way you see every single network visualization on the planet, which is a bunch of circles with lines connecting it uh, these days. So he, does, he, he sort of generates a field in that way, and then he do, designs, using basic uh, cellular automaton model, a way of moving through the whole field, and then every time he touches a node, it's sounded, right? So I'll listen to this, I just, I set up a small excerpt. Uh, all I kind of need you to listen for, other than you know, the sort of beauty and the set experience that you'll have as an individual, but kind of functionally, I think what you'll hear is a kind of Oral similarity that then is surpassed, I think you can hear the lexical jump because it no longer sounds like more of the same. as a simulation of creativity. So the idea is that all of this work that is done compositionally is done simulating creativity and he sort of you know, denies his agency beyond the initial uh, instructions. 
And moreover, and this is, I think, more interesting than that conversation, he works specifically according to a model of cognition developed by Melissa Schilling that describes moments of creative insight as occurring when an atypical association reconfigures a subject's field of representations such that what she calls shortcuts are created. So basically, for Schilling, who happens to work, uh, <laughs> it's an amazing time for jobs, right? I can't remember her title, but it's, it's, it's one of these sort of crazy titles where she's in a business school, but she does neuroscience, right? Which is enough to make anybody a fart. <laughs> uh, it's not a business school, so it's a school of marketing. Um, uh, and actually, if you ever want to hear some of the greatest stuff on this, uh, Mark Carew has these amazing uh, papers on uh, neuroscience and marketing. Uh, with Sam. In any case. Um, creative insight for Schilling is, quote, a process whereby an individual moves suddenly from a state of not knowing how to solve a problem to a state of knowing how to solve it. It's an aha moment that she describes it. So if we imagine the field of representations through which the problem is articulated as another instance of one of these basic nodes and edges network visualization, the process she's describing of creative insight is equivalent to shortening the path from the problem to the solution, so the path from any of these source files to the file that would be defined as the solution, uh, if you will. And I won't get into it too deeply, uh, but as small world graph theory demonstrates, one way to shorten that path, the number of links that's, uh, that are necessary, is just to actually add random reconfigurations of the network. Right? Uh, so that's, you know, that's basically Schilling, how Schilling is thinking about creative insight. I think, just as a starter, we can consider Schilling's approach to creative insight to be computational, which is a word I like to use in this study, because it frames every problem, right, as a problem, every problem as a quantity of flattened time. Right? I think what we can see here is actually a quantity of labor measured in comp computing cycles rather than in man hours. Right? So really, in the context of the computer, I would say there is no such thing as a problem proper. Right? There's no such thing as a before thrownness to invoke possibly an apocryphal etymology of the word problem, but it's one I'm sticking to anyway. Uh, there's no such thing as a problem proper, or a problem proper, but instead simply a quantity of computation required to actualize an end that's encoded in the field of possibilities from the beginning. This is what makes a computer a computer following Turing. Right? A computer is a machine that can compute anything that is computable given enough time memory. Right? No matter what is computed, computability itself does not change definitionally. So thinking of insight computationally, thinking of creative insight computationally, as Schilling does, I think we could see that as a two-step production. First, it qualifies insight as a computable problem, right? It qualifies insights as computable problems, and thus quantifies them in terms of how much computational time and memory they require to solve. So in the case of Toll, we can see Schilling's approach to creativity reflected, and again, Mertz is explicit about this, uh, in the software if we understand aural similarity as configuring this field of freesound.org files at any given moment. So every file in the freesound.org database exists uh, as an expression of its recursive similarity to uh, the source file that is identified. And then lexical relationships disrupt and redistribute this field by changing what counts as the source file introducing new node and potential for creative insight in the form of alternate paths. What this raises for me, though, is a, I think, well, a question that's not very interesting, but maybe the answers are interesting. Uh, if we're thinking of Toll as solving a problem, thinking of this piece of music as solving a problem, thinking of this creative insight as an instance of problem solving, which is what creativity is, again, in the creative economy, what precisely is the problem that's being solved? Now, a first answer, and we answer your fear all the time in art schools, uh, by the brilliant people who populate those buildings, uh, first answer might just be production of a creative work. Right? But I think, for myself at least, I have to reject that answer for a couple of reasons. First, the piece Toll is clearly, explicitly indebted to a tradition of Keynesian aesthetics, John Keynesian aesthetics, where the problem of creativity at the level of production Right, is always already solved, because anything in that aesthetic model is potentially interesting. So it's not a problem to create something interesting because the world itself is manifestly interesting. And you can hear in this piece, if you're familiar with Cage's work at all, it's a 
fairly explicit reference to um, Cage's really famous 1952 piece, I believe, uh, Williams Mix, which is a kind of cut up tape piece. It's super interesting. Uh, but actually, the piece doesn't just refer to this tradition uh, through its basic sound collage sound world over here. Um, it actually relies on this understanding if we want to think about it as a piece in the first place. Right? If we're going to hear this thing as more than just a bunch of a succession of sounds, it relies on some sort of aesthetic proposition. As Stephen Conner puts it, uh, musical listening, quote, activates a minor form of hallucination in which we actively give to the sounds we hear a kind of structure and expressive intent so that they, that they might not otherwise possess. And remember, hallucinations are effectively real, right? Like sound, we can think of them as ideal events that have real material effects. Uh, and this tra tradition creates the conditions for a musical hallucination to take place, the Cajun tradition. Right? So we, the idea is that we somehow, by listening musically, hallucinate that the su su succession of events is in some sense, if not meaningful, at least directed towards me. So that's one reason why I think it doesn't quite work to say the problem that's being solved with this piece is just simply the production of a creative work. And the other reason I think follows from that. Um, <clears throat> the speculative nature of this Cajun approach means to my mind precisely, precisely that the aesthetic demand is shifted from needing to satisfy an existing definition of beauty, of course, to something like opening new kinds of beauty to which we might learn to listen. So I would say, in a speculative aesthetic, uh, and I would say this with some force, uh, it's not the problem field that's reconfigured, but instead the very constitution of these nodes, sorry, these are the nodes, the lines of the edges, of the nodes and edges within that field. The internal inconsistencies of the network's balances, affordances, weights, and so forth. So as Anna Munster really brilliantly explains, to take an edge seriously, to take a connection seriously, means to value the force of relation, right? It means to, to value its capacity to change the things in relation at the very moment that change itself relationally occurs. So put simply, it just isn't compelling, I think, to think of Merck's <coughs> software in terms of generating creative insight, if generating creative insight means solving the problem. And really, I think this jives with the experience of most practitioners, and I would include creative and scholarly practitioners alike, the experience of most practitioners, I think, uh, would identify, most people, I hope, would identify what they do as at least partially and importantly involved in problem expansion rather than solutions, right? Involved in extending rather than contracting the time between the moment of encounter with the work and the moment when it's folded back into this kind of crushing banality of everyday existence. That is, I think, how most people think of what they do. Like. So, instead of creative insight, I think we can approach toll in terms of sonification with some caveats. Now, sonification is the term that typically implies a simple medial translation, a relatively kind of neutral case of transcoding, if you will, where some sort of inaudible information is made audible, <clears throat> perhaps exposing patterns that we might not notice, quote, where the information presented visually. This is from a definition up by Walker in this room four years ago. Um, I think the kind of object example in contemporary art history of this would be uh, the artist Christina Kubisch's work. I don't know if anybody's familiar with this work, but she's done these really great electro electrical walks. Um, basically, they're public walks with special sensitive wireless headphones by which you can hear the acoustic qualities of above ground and underground electromagnetic frequencies. So the idea is that you can put these, head these headphones on and walk through the city, and you can go up and hear uh, the EMF uh, emissions of, you know, like an ATM. You can hear, as you're walking down the street, things like um, very active cell uh, passages. Last time I was here, I was talking about, I think, my friend who became electrosensitive and could actually sense these things without, um, without the headphones. But it's a kind of basic, it's an update, if you will, of kind of psychogeography, where you can walk the city and map it according to its uh, density and types of EMF frequencies, and this is specifically audible. So Kubish's works are exemplary of a really dominant approach to sonification that happens all the time in sound art. I think it's great work. I think it's really, really great work. But it's also work that, in the way it's discussed, uh, is criticized 
quite a bit. And I think the, the, the criticisms are valid. Because it, pres it presents art, or sorry, in presenting art as, quote, the medium of conveyance for that which we cannot speak, it's criticized for neglecting the, quote, reality that art as a cultural activity with a tradition and conventions constitutes and is constituted by a vast meaning-making structure that functions in some sense in the narrative text. 